preaching on under the blood. Can you say amen to that? Under the blood. I'm amazed sometimes at the Christians that really don't have confidence in their salvation. I'm amazed at how people feel somehow, at least they seem to feel, and they seem to express a lot of times that they feel that the blood is fragile, that their salvation is fragile. I have to tell you, a lot of that has to do with who gets to you when. If some kind of a person gets to you, be it a mother or a father, a pastor or an evangelist or somebody gets to you and ever puts the thought in you that this salvation is so fragile you have to live perfect in order to be ready to meet the Lord, then you're going to live a miserable life. I was really blessed to have two key people in my life that really helped me. My pastor was a gracious man. He was a powerful preacher. He was very smart, brilliant man. But he was a man of mercy, and he was a man that understood the grace of God. My mother was another wonderful person. She was a little Indian woman. She wasn't but four foot eleven, but she was full of mercy and she was full of grace. And my mother always taught me to live right and to do right, but that the blood was powerful, and that the blood would secure me and keep me. I don't really necessarily preach necessarily that, you know, when you get saved that you're guaranteed to be saved the rest of your life and no matter what you do, you're going to be ready for heaven. I think that's risky. I believe that you can backslide and I believe that you can sin and I believe that, you know, you can jeopardize your salvation. But on the other hand, I'm trying to help you to understand that the blood is very powerful. Can you shout amen? amen. And... Um, Suppose somebody's lived for God and right before the rapture takes place or right before they die, they slip up and they say something they shouldn't have said. It's like, oh, gee, man, you missed it right at the last minute. <laughs> so the blood removed the judgment from the Jewish people. The Lord said, I'll pass through the land of Egypt this night and I'll smite all the firstborn, he said, in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. So not only was it the firstborn of a family that died, but it was the firstborn of their animals. And he said, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. It was judgment day in Egypt. It was announced. It struck suddenly at midnight. They were to be ready. They were to be prepared. And there was death everywhere. In chapter 12, verse 30 of Exodus, it says, And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all of his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt. There was not a house where there was not someone dead in Egypt, an animal or a person. Yet in that same hour, not one Jewish home was touched. Everybody was safe. So what I'm trying to say is, the death angel discriminated. The death angel discriminated. Those that did not have the blood, they were not prepared. They were not believers. They did not believe. They did not put that blood on the doorpost. The Jews that did, the angel discriminated, and they were safe. That angel, that death angel, the Lord himself is discriminatory. He's discriminatory in many ways. For believers, he promises peace. For those that are transgressors against him, he promises a rough life. For those that bless Israel, he says you'll have peace, you'll be blessed. For those that curse Israel, 
He's a discriminator. He said, a curse will come on you. For those that accept Christ and they look to him as the author and finisher of their faith and their salvation, they walk a different way. They walk a different path. They live a different kind of a life than people that's not Christians. You know that as well as I do. It's evident. The Lord is a discriminator. And the thing that makes the difference is the blood. And when the death angel passed over, those that had the blood were safe. Those that did not have the blood suffered tremendous loss. That blood was not on that doorpost because they were good. That, door, that blood was on the doorpost because they obeyed. You see what I'm saying? That blood was not on that doorpost because Israel was backslidden. Israel had rebelled against God. That's the reason they just got through spending a sentence of 400 years in Egypt because of their rebellion and because they wouldn't do what God said to do. That blood was on the doorpost and they just obeyed simple instruction. They obeyed, but it didn't mean that they were worthy. It didn't mean that they were perfect. It didn't mean that they were good. As a matter of fact, many of them were given Moses trouble and Aaron trouble even that night whenever the blood was applied to the doorposts. They were rebellious even against Moses then, bucking up against him and didn't want to leave Egypt. And Moses really had to cajole them to leave Egypt. If God had waited for all of them to be perfect, none would have escaped. <laughs> They would have all died if God had to wait for all of them to be perfect. But let me tell you something. God's not waiting for all of us to be perfect either. It's the blood of Jesus Christ that sanctifies us and preserves us and keeps us. So soon God knew that they would even be dancing around a golden calf. He knew that. I want to talk about that for a few minutes. Can you imagine Jesus when he was here? He was the spotless, perfect son of God. And my goodness, what a motley crew he had calls his disciples. <laughs> Peter was rambunctious. He was presumptuous. He was not uh, what you would think that a disciple of the Lord would be. He was quick-tempered. John was called the son of thunder. <laughs> you know? You had Luke the physician, you had tax collectors, you had all kind of people. And whenever Jesus came, he was totally righteous and totally perfect, walking among 12 men that was totally imperfect. Can't you imagine the frustration that he had when he laid down at night like, my God, why hast thou forsaken me right now? <laughs> he was having to say, at times he said to the sons of thunder, well, what's that to you? You know? But here's the thing. Jesus did not concentrate on their flaws. He concentrated on their future. I said he didn't concentrate on their flaws. He concentrated on their future. And many people here today, and under the sound of my voice, you've got, many of you have got a fear. It's just beneath the surface, but it is a fear that one day if the rapture takes place, you're wondering whenever everybody starts going up if you're gonna to have to sort of jump and help him a little bit. <laughs> like, you know, let me go up to the mountain and whenever I, I you know, I'll, no, let me tell you. If you're gonna be raptured, if you're going to heaven when you die, it won't be by works, it will be by the grace and the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what's gonna do it. It will be by blood. You know, I, a lot of people look at preachers and they think, well, surely they're going. You know what? I look at church people and say, surely they're going. You know, but the truth of the matter is, if any of us goes, it won't be by works, lest any man should boast. It'll be by grace and by the blood of the Lamb of God. That's what's going to do it. But many people have this fear. It's just beneath the surface, and almost everybody's got it that one day if I ever get to heaven, you're worried about that first eye-to-eye -eye contact with the Lord. 
you're worried about that. Most, most Christians that I deal with and have taught with and counseled through the years, they're worried about that first contact with Christ or God the Father. It's like, oh, I don't think he's going to like me. <laughs> he's not going to like you. He's going to love you. He's going to love you. For God so loved the what? The world. God's got some real rascals in his family. But he loves them every one. And it's the blood, it is the blood that's the determining factor. How many of you can say amen to God's got some rascals in his family? <laughs> you know what, let me ask you a question. Let me just ask you this question. If you could get perfect, which I know is impossible, but if you could get perfect all of a sudden, as soon as you got perfect, everything perfect now, my works is great, my thinking is great, I've treated everybody right, I'm caught up on my ties, I love God, I'm perfect! And then a telephone call, ah, you know. So how severe, let me ask you this, how severe does it have to be before the Lord says, I'm going to let the devil cross the bloodline and come in your house and get you? What the Lord said to the Jews that night was this. He said, I will not allow the angel to come into your house and to take the firstborn because of the blood and the blood alone. Amen. I will not let the devil cross that bloodline. I have a question I want to ask you. If God didn't let the, de uh, let the angel cross the bloodline, what makes you think he'll let the devil cross the bloodline? Amen. Come on, help me. Let me ask that question one more time. If God wouldn't let that death angel cross that bloodline, what makes you think he'd let a demon cross that bloodline? He's not going to do it. God chooses their deliverance by one method and one method only, and that was by the blood. It was all grace, and it was all mercy. Second, they were safe when the death angel came through, and they were safe under the blood, but they were not yet delivered. That's something I want to talk about for a minute. Still, they had to be freed from Pharaoh's grip. The death angel came through, but Pharaoh still got a grip on them. Still, they had to be delivered and cross the Red Sea. Still, they had a wilderness to face. Still, they had giants that was going to intimidate them. Then they had walls of Jericho that they had to face. Then they had enemy strongholds where they had to rout the enemy and chase the enemy out of the land God promised them. So what that teaches us is this. Before you can ever be successful against the enemy or any obstacle, you've got to first know that you're under the blood. That's good. Think about that just for a minute. You don't understand, a lot of you don't understand that whenever you ask the Lord to come into your life and you're saved by the blood, it doesn't mean that you're delivered right then and everything's hunky-dory. It just means you're a Christian now. That's what it means. It means you're a Christian. It means you have been accepted in the beloved. It means that Jesus Christ has saved you, washed your sins. Now judgment has passed over you. Now you're part of the family of God, but it means that you may still smoke. It means you may still drink. So here's what I'm trying to say to some of you, maybe that you're really struggling. You're struggling about church, and you think, well, I'm not good enough to go to church. I like that church over there. I like that preacher. I like that singing, but I'm just not good enough to go to church. I still drink a little bit, or I still go to those pornographic websites, and I feel really bad about it. Listen, the great thing is you feel really bad about it. You're convicted about it. But right now, the Lord has saved you. There may still be some things like that, but God's not going to leave you like that. He's going to clean you up, and he's going to deliver you powerfully by the power of God. Somebody shout amen. amen. Hallelujah. 
So they were safe, but they were not yet delivered. Still had to face Pharaoh, still had to face the Red Sea, still had to face the giants, all those things. So what this teaches us is, before we can against, succeed against any enemy or any obstacle, the first thing that you've got to know is, I'm under the blood. Let me ask this question today to those of you that's watching me, or those of you that's here in this building. How many of you know, even though you're imperfect, I'm under the blood? Can I see your hand, please? I'm under the blood. Many Pentecostal preachers through the years, many holiness preachers through the years, have erroneously led people to believe that if they didn't dress a certain way, or they didn't act a certain way, or they didn't go out knocking on doors and witnessing and handing out tracts, or if they still smoked a cigarette occasionally or whatever, they, they led people to believe that if you're not perfect, you're not saved. I want to tell you today, by grace are you saved through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. You're saved by the blood. You're saved by the blood, and the blood brings you in into the family of God. And there's so many things that we all struggle with, and they're probably going to be things that you'll struggle with till you die. You say, Brother Kilpatrick, I'm surprised to hear that come from a, a Pentecostal preacher and a revivalist. Just because I'm a Pentecostal preacher doesn't mean I'm an idiot. <laughs> Just because I'm a revivalist doesn't mean that I'm hard-nosed and unmerciful. That's the kind of thing that the Lord's trying to get us away from. We're saved by the blood. How many times during revival at Brownsville, how many times did I pray for people? I prayed for some people till I don't think I got fingertips left much on my hands. Me and Steve prayed for just about every one of those four and a half million people that came through those doors at Brownsville. We laid hands on all of them. I'm sure we did. There was some I laid hands on 10, 20, 30, 40 times in one night. <laughs> one guy come up to me and uh, he said, Brother Kilpatrick, I want you to pray for me. He said, I just, I'm bound by lust and I need to be free. And I, pow, I said, be free in the name of Jesus. He came back up 10 minutes later. He said, it ain't working. I'm still. <laughs> I'm still bound. How do you know? Well, I just, no, never mind. <laughs> so no matter how guilty you feel, no matter how condemned you may feel, no matter how inadequate, inadequate or insecure you may feel, you got to understand I am under the blood. And you got to understand it's not earned, it is a gift of God. So I really wonder sometime how many believers are really resting, you've learned to rest under the security of knowing you're under the blood. How many have really learned to rest in that? Like I told you a while ago, and I won't take but a minute on this, I had very good input into my life. And my mother and my pastor both told me constantly how much God loved me and how his hand was on my life, how God was going to use me. And they both walked me through a lot of things, but they always let me know that I was loved and I had the blood in my life. And when I got into ministry... I was sort of shocked as I began to deal with people of all persuasions, young and old, all different backgrounds, of how many people never really had learned to rest under the knowledge that they're under the blood. I was really sort of shocked at that. So that night, <laughs> whenever that death angel came through, the house that was insecure was safe and the house that was secure was safe. And I want to say this to you and listen to what I'm going to say. Nobody that night that had the blood on the transom or on the doorpost, nobody that had the blood applied moved in and out of safety that night. 
See, what happens to us a lot of times is our emotions and our mind makes us feel one minute we're safe and the next minute we feel totally insecure. But when that blood's applied, it makes no difference what you feel. You've heard me tell about Brenda, haven't you? We got married. I was 18. I was 18 years and two days old. And we couldn't even get married in Georgia because I had to be older to get married in Georgia. But in Alabama, that's why I moved to Alabama. <laughs> I could get married as soon as I turned 18. So me and Brenda got married on Saturday, July the 13th of 1968. So we had to go across the river from where I lived in Georgia and went to church there. My pastor was in Georgia, Columbus, Georgia. So we had to go in Phoenix City to get married. So we went over to White Rock Assembly of God Church and we got married. Just me and my best man, LaVon Gibson, and Brenda's maid of honor, Sandra, and Brother Wetzel. And we stood there in an empty church and got married in a fake ceremony because that night we're going back and we're going to get married in Georgia, but we couldn't get married legally there. We got married, you know, legally in Alabama that day. So we're in the back seat, pastor's driving, and Brenda's got on her wedding dress, you know, and she's holding my hand, and I'm staring out the window. And I'm thinking to myself, my God, whew, I'm married now. I was just a kid. I didn't weigh but 167 pounds. And so uh, she looked up at me and she kissed me on the side of the cheek and she said, Penny for your thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't look at her. I just, she wanted to know what my thoughts was. And my thoughts was, I said, I don't feel married. And she said, as only she can say, well, Bobo, <laughs> she said, Bobo, you better get your feelings adjusted with the facts. <laughs> but let me ask you this, though. Isn't that true sometime how the Holy Spirit needs to say to us, you're not moving in and out of safety. You're not moving in and out of security. You're safe under the blood of the Lamb. And you know what? In ball games, whenever that umpire says, safe, you can throw your hat, you can spit tobacco, you can swing at him, but you're still safe. It came out of the mouth of the umpire, amen? The Lord says tonight, you're safe, safe under the blood of the Lamb. Now, <laughs> let me close. I, I got another point here to go real quick, and let me close here. So what some people do is some people trust the blood and other people trample the blood. And you have to be careful, don't trample the blood because here's what the devil will do. He'll make you feel like, well, there's no use. You're still lustful. There's no use. You still have pornographic leanings. There's no use. You still want alcohol. And so what the devil wants you to do then is just throw in the towel and say, well, nothing really happened to me. Yes, it did. You were covered in the blood but you've yet got to be delivered. I love this. The Lord didn't say, when you see the blood. He said, when I see the blood. Look at that. The Lord didn't say, when you see the blood. Because you see, friend, you can't see the blood. But it's when I see the blood. I will pass over you. Let me ask you this question. How many of you would be at peace today if I told you that even though you can't see the blood, he sees the blood on you. And it ought to bring you peace. Now, th the second part of this message that I wanted to get to, and this is one of the areas I've been really trying to get to all morning, God delivers by a strong hand. Look what it says in Exodus 13 and verse 9. It shall be for a sign unto thee and upon thine hand, and it shall be for a memorial between thine eyes, and the Lord's law may be in thy mouth. For with a strong hand hath the Lord brought thee out of Egypt, with a strong hand. All right, now a while ago, I talked to you about the blood, and that's the most important thing. But when it comes to your deliverance, God said, now I'm going to deliver you by my strong hand. Hallelujah. 
How many of you has ever experienced the strong right arm of God's power? How many of you has ever been delivered from a, from a terrible wreck? Are you been delivered from a terrible tragedy that almost happened and the Lord stepped in at the last minute and saved you? Not only are you under the blood, but we're not just talking about a, a son of God here that just shed his blood for us, but we're talking about God Almighty that's got a mighty arm of power, his right arm of power, and he says, I will deliver you. And he says, I will deliver you with my right arm of power. So the thing that I want to talk to you about right now for a few minutes is deliverance. It says this shall be when your son asks you in times to come saying, what is this that you shall say unto him? By the strength of the hand of the Lord, he brought us out from Egypt from the house of bondage. I love what this says, Psalms. How did you drive out the heathen with thy hand and plant them? How did you afflict the people and cast them out? For they didn't get the land in possession by their own sword, neither did their own arm save them, but thy right hand and thine arm and the light of thy countenance, because you had favor unto them. Let me ask you this question. How many of you knows here today that God has shown his favor on you by delivering you and by saving you? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Now watch this. Through thee we will push down our enemies. Through thy name we will tread them under that rise up against us, for I will not trust in my bow, neither shall my sword save me. We're safe under the blood, we're forgiven, but God breaks the power of sin by his strong right arm. Sin may dwell, but the Lord says he will not let it rule. Sin, I think, is always going to be present in your life. The Bible says if we say we have no sin, we're a liar. Sin may dwell even in our mortal flesh. We struggle with it. We wrestle with it. That's something that needs to be said. For those of you that's been raised so rigid and so strict into believing that you've got to be perfect and you feel self-righteous, you need to understand that there's still sin that dwells in your mortal body. And there's still things that dwell in your mind, even though our mind is renewed and transformed, we're still in the process of transformation and renewal. But you need to realize that sin dwells in our mortal bodies and we just still struggle with it. But what the Lord says is, you may struggle with it, you may feel it, but I will not let it rule over your life anymore. And I love this scripture in Exodus. This is one of my favorite scriptures in the whole Bible. It said, the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. He pursued after the children of Israel and the children of Israel went out with a high hand. Look at that. The Bible says, the right hand of the Lord has become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, hath dashed in pieces the enemy. The blood secures, but the hand of the Lord delivers. There's power in God's right hand. We're not at the mercy of our enemies. Don't you think for a minute that the enemy is more powerful than God? God has a strong right arm, and in time he will use that right arm to deliver you. And had God not delivered you so many times, the devil would have took you out a long time ago. You're still here, you're still standing, you're still serving God, and that's the way it is. And here's what the Bible says in Peter. It says, humble yourself, therefore under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due season. I love this. <laughs> I remember whenever my little boys were little, he said, uh, I want to drive. I said, okay, let's do it right now. So he put his hands on the steering wheel, you know, and he wanted to immediately start doing this right here. <laughs> and uh, he couldn't reach the pedal, of course, and I had my foot on the pedal. And I'm sitting there, and he's in my lap. And so he thinks, and I said, no, 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 you can't do that. We're going to have to keep it in the road now. So I let him try to drive, and, you know, sure enough, was going off toward the median. So I reached over, and I just took my thumb and my finger like that, and I held the steering wheel straight, you know, where we could stay in the road. He said, Daddy, I'm driving. <laughs> I said, yeah, you are. And then he looked, and he said, take your hand off the steering wheel. I'm driving. <laughs> <laughs> Then I, I put my knee up underneath there, you know, where it just touched my leg, and I held my hands out like this, and I said, you, look up there, whoa, 
John Michael's driving, Mama, look. And he was just, <laughs> you know. But I had him, I had him, I had him. And you know, a lot of times we think we're so big. A lot of times we think we're so mighty. But what God says, I got you. I got you. And I want to say this to some of you right now, and some of you watching me by television, you hear me? You're in a precarious place. I feel it. I know it. You're in a precarious place. Some of you is going through pure hell, and you're in the driver's seat, and you're thinking, my God, this thing's going to bounce off in the ditch. And the Lord says, no, nah, I got you. My hand is on you. My hand is on you. My hand has got this covered. I've got this covered. And I'd like to say to those of you that are watching me by television, you're watching me by internet, God's got it. He's not going to let you wreck. He's got you. You're under the blood. His hand is on you. What else can you ask for? One more time. Let's praise him real quickly. Everybody. <laughs> Hallelujah. This Insight broadcast was made possible by the faithful support from partners and friends of John Kilpatrick Ministries. If you would like to help us continue this outreach, we invite you to consider becoming a monthly partner today. Your gift will enable us to continue to bring hope and restoration to the body of Christ. Feel free to explore johnkilpatrick.org where you can discover ministry resources, upcoming events, and much more. Be sure to follow us on Facebook and Twitter at Rev Kilpatrick. We look forward to hearing from you.